The class of diabetic medication known as SGLT2 inhibitors, I believe they have the potential to be one of the best longevity drugs out there. So let's dive into the data and I'll make some comparisons with them. And the reason why I'm such a fan of any drug or supplement that improves insulin sensitivity is we're just exposed to more excess calories than we ever have been. And this is not just our distant ancestors, our recent ones too. So SGLT2 stands for sodium glucose co-transporter 2 and it's a protein transporter that sits in the tubule of the kidney and under normal circumstances this protein transporter about close to 100 percent of that glucose is reabsorbed back into the bloodstream so depending which drug and dose up to 400 calories a day can be excreted out from your urine so that equates to lower glucose levels and therefore insulin and then mild ketone increase and then uh, just it's, it's basically it's a, a true calorie restriction mimetic and if you don't know calorie restriction is one of the most proven things you can do for increasing lifespan and of course less renal tubal workload equates to reduce oxidative stress in the kidneys and i've seen this with my kidney age over the space of eight months it reversed by 2.84 years by using a type of sglt2 and then looking in the animal data uh, looking at canagliflozin, uh, both there's been two studies with it, one starting at 17 months and the other one at 16 months. And both saw, uh, this is in male mice, a 14% increase in median lifespan. But in one study, it appeared to be neutral in female mice. And then the other one, it was a modest 6% increase in lifespan. And then looking at the drug that I use, empagliflozin, and this was in a male-only mice cohort, and they saw an increase of 5.9% in these mice, their survival rate. Other longevity pathways with this class of drug is reduced SASPs, otherwise known as senescence-associated secretory phenotypes. This has been demonstrated in mice with reduced uh, SAS being secreted from adipose tissue. And there's also, it's been shown that the, it lowers serum uh, uric acid. Obviously, this goes up with age. So this can uh, reduce xanthine oxidase driven oxidative stress so the main difference between those two drugs i mentioned starting with canagliflozin it has more uh, sglt1 inhibition uh, spillover also a uh, complex one inhibition of the mitochondria only partial and so it, that's why it appears to be a bit more powerful but then it's for some people this is also a turn off complex one inhibition of mitochondria can also have lots of downstream effects when done too much and i found that out with myself doing metformin even at four days a week my cardio output dropped by three and five percent and i measure it on the cross trainer reading the subtitles in a steady state environment and then uh, seeing how much i can read by the end of it when i uh, when i lift up uh, looking at the calorie output on that device and because i'm going as hard as i can while reading subtitles on the news it's a pretty good marker of not just vo2 max but just recovery in general and that's what i noticed with myself on metformin energy collapse in those muscle cells and then moving on to that other drug i mentioned empagliflozin so that's more of a clean sglt2 block so empagliflozin could be a good choice if you've had a poor experience with metformin, it being a potent complex one inhibitor. Or say if you're using uh, like berberine, dihydroberberine, a more bioavailable form or even better berberine phytosome, that, that is a less uh, severe complex one inhibitor. And that's what I'm using actually, berberine phytosome, but just on weekends, I seem to fare okay with that. So say if you've got, if you wanna keep it simple with your protocol, then dempagliflozin might be a better option. But if you're doing a lot of other things, say AMPK activators, like uh, you've got r stabilized alpha lipoic acid, then, or you're doing lots of fasted exercise too, that again activates AMPK. So it just depends on your lifestyle and your protocol, which drug would be a better choice. Check out our 12 month rejuvenation program where every three months we look at 225 different biomarkers and get your future vitality optimized. There's even a six month break clause if your situation was to change. There's also another drug that's promising in this class called Cetagliflozin. So not only is it an SGLT2 inhibitor, but it also has 
SGLT1 inhibition in the intestines. There's no uh, lifespan data on it yet, but there is strong heart failure and chronic kidney failure data on it. It's been shown to delay carb uptake as well as increasing its GLP-1 secretion, much like the other popular diabetic drug acarbose, or even berberine to a certain level helps with GLP-1. And in the ITP trials with mice combining acarbose with rapamycin, they saw a staggering 28% increase in male median lifespan. And there's uh, rapamycin is, say, it's the, the most robust longevity drug out there with a high translational potential from animals to humans. It's very well understood its mTOR C1 inhibition properties. And I really think theoretically at least that SGLT2 inhibitors will stack very nicely with rapamycin. You've got uh, restraint of mTOR, while a uh, fuel shift towards uh, ketosis, you know, fasting like state. And then you've got down regulation of NLRP3 uh, signaling, so that's reducing SASPs. And while rapamycin is very popular in the longevity community, I've spoken to a lot of people that have used it. It's very slow, subtle, works in the background. You know, you're not going to see your glucose drop or your waistline shrink. Whereas with an SGLT2 inhibitor, that's why it's one of my favorite longevity drugs because people generally do notice it. You'll see your fasting glucose come down. Uh, you know, you have like a metabolic shift, uh, potentially even more energy as well. And some people notice their blood pressure coming down. So it's something you can see in real time, which can be really motivating for people. I mentioned about glucose, not just fasting, but postprandial glucose as well, you know, after a meal. And so, so if you're restricting carbohydrates, that can become a quite onerous, even complex ones. And then even uh, your gut microbiome diversity can be affected by restricting carbohydrates. And in mice models, when you restrict carbohydrates do extremely, then that doesn't extend lifespan, whereas protein restriction does. And so that's mimicking more um, uh, rapamycin, protein restriction, mTOR inhibition. In particular, you know, you've got methionine, leucine, glutamine. These are very potent mTOR expressors. So I think both drugs have a lot of potential for longevity. If you're someone that's say migrating from just supplements to experimenting with longevity drugs, it really depends on your bar markers, which one to start with. If you're a little bit uh, glucose vulnerable, you're not, it's not at the bottom end of healthy, then uh, an SGLT2 inhibitor could be a good place to start. And to touch on my own protocol with Empagliflozin, originally when I first started it in the summer 2024, I was on the maximum dose of 25 milligrams. And then uh, with my diet at the time, I was starting to border into the hypoglycemic range. So I dropped it down to 12 and a half milligrams. And then I've been less stringent with my calories. I did at one point measure them and I was eating two and a half thousand a day. I need to re-measure really my average calorie intake. It's definitely higher than that. And that's why I dropped from the uh, 25 milligrams down to 12 and a half. And then while being on that dose, my glucose crept up a bit because I was eating more calories, trying to not be so deprived of you know even protein itself. And for that reason, in the last few months, I've gone back up to 25 milligrams again. And yeah, I'm seeing my uh, glucose, because I've got a glucose continuous monitor, I'm actually seeing it's really, it is helping keeping those post-meal spikes down for sure. There's a chance you could go hypoglycemic, especially if you're combining it with other things that improve insulin sensitivity. There's one thing just bordering into uh, like light hypoglycemia, but when you go deep into that, that can be dangerous. For example, going very deep into a fast on any diabetic medication could be risky. And that's why I'm gonna continue with this glucose monitor long-term, because I think that uh, insulin sensitivity, low glucose, that is a very potent thing for extending lifespan because insulin resistance just happens over decades and decades. So if you're hardly using any insulin, that's gonna promote lifespan and it's very heavily weighted in various different clocks. So to summarize, I think the future is very bright for SGLT2 inhibitors. I'm very much looking forward to seeing any ITP longevity data with it, as well as anecdotal reports that people come back to me with so if you like that video, then check out this one on my entire anti-aging stack. Thanks for watching. See you next time.